Welcome into our latest Hear Me, See Me podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Bruner. Hear Me, See Me is a project of WIBW-TV being very intentional all this year about raising awareness of mental health and issues surrounding mental health. To that end, we've been sharing stories with you here on the podcast, and you've heard people say all the time, check on your well friends, check on your happy friends. That's what we dive into today. Tevin Harmon is a content creator. A lot of people have come to know him in recent months when he started doing these videos about, I'm from Topeka, of course, XYZ. He also has started a couple new podcasts of his own, and Tevin is here with us today to share his story. So thank you very much. When we read the bio, I was kind of trying to find out a little bit who is Tevin, right? Because you're everywhere these days. And then I see mental health advocate, and that made me explore your story a little bit more. So we'll get into that. Yeah. But first of all, what is this I'm from Topeka movement that you have been sparking? It just kind of started randomly. Like, uh, I really started like in my TikTok series of like, I have bipolar two, of course. And I went with that. And then, you know, I was like, I'm just stepping into content creation full time. And I was like, you know, a lot of people don't know where Topeka is that are my followers on TikTok. Um, so I was like, I'm gonna do I'm from Topeka one. And just casually just going out and doing like our normal spots, you know, Brown versus Boar, Frito Lay, Topeka High, places like that. And um, it kind of just sparked a huge interest on Facebook. And I remember I was on the phone with my dad and I posted on Facebook and we we're just having a casual conversation. And I go back like 10 minutes after I posted it. And the first one was like, 200 shares and it's, <laughs> I was like oh this is this is going crazy <laughs> and um, so it kind of just sparked its own series and you know I was like you know I want to highlight local businesses and you know different unique places around Topeka that people don't really know about. Well because you also kind of poked fun a little bit. For sure. I mean the one that resonated with me was the pothole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we yeah. talk about that but what I loved about it was you can poke fun at these things you can acknowledge that you know what we have these challenges but I'm still proud of where I am it's like absolutely. we can make fun of ourselves but don't you dare yeah, um, and say that that's why you don't like us because this is our place this is our home yeah absolutely and, and I think that's what it's all about I think a lot of people don't realize that content creation and where they're trying to go is if you can make people laugh you'll get people to return and it's not necessarily something about like I want to make sure I'm viral and I'm famous or anything like that but it's just like poking fun at like a little bit of the things that we deal with here um, that's something that people deal with throughout the whole United States and different cities as well but you know it seems like we only talk about it because we're always here and we're always surrounded by it so um, it's definitely something that to have fun with by poking a little fun at it. When I watch those videos though I see a very positive person. Sure. You're happy, you're smiling, you're having a good time. Um, what, your latest ones where you go through the drive through of a, of a fast food change and, and, and try their drinks. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're having a good time with your family. Um, what do we need to be cautious of when it comes to thinking that that's all there is to Tevin? Honestly, um, I try to share, I, well I do share as much authenticity about me as, as, as I can because I think with having mental illness is people just think like, oh, he's posting, you know, the Peace, Love and Harm and Happy Hour where we do, do review drinks and he's posting, you know, these collaborations with businesses. But all in all is I also talk about like, hey, I'm not always feeling the best. You know, there's days where I have to fight getting out of bed um, and social media can run that down mentally, can run your mental down very, very much so to where you're like, I don't, I don't even want to do it no more. Because if you really start to look into like negative comments or you look into, oh, this video is not getting as much views as this video, and you start comparing things, um, it really can take a toll on your mental health. So um, I try to be as authentic as I can and really open up and share that side. So um, they see a lot of positivity in me, um, but that's honestly like ever since I've really stepped down this path and really embraced who I am mentally, it's kind of, I mean, that's that's who I am. You, you know? have to see the whole you. Absolutely. And know that it's not always yeah. fun, happy, sonic drinks. No. <laughs> no, it's not always. Not always. Um, so t take me back to the start of that path. Yeah. Um, and it probably is before you even knew what the path exactly was. So yeah. what was happening as you were growing up? How were you feeling? What was going on in your life that had you and maybe your family a little worried? Yeah. So um, I've always, I've had like a little bit of the ADHD and... Um, to where I've always wanted to start a project and move on to the next thing. Uh, different, I'm 31, I've had over 35 different jobs here. Um, I've started working when I was 15. I also played sports, very competitive growing up. 
Um, and I've always just kind of relayed like, oh, if I'm going to jump from job to job, it's just because it's not what I'm meant to do. It's not what I want to do. Um, but come back to the fact once I got diagnosed with bipolar 2, is like, no, that's a that's a trait to where like you don't want to stay at a certain place. You can stay there for six months or two months. So a lot of my cases is um, once I got there for two months, I was like, oh, I love this job. I'm going to be here forever. I'm going to retire from here. And then two months comes in. I'm like, yeah, this isn't for me, <laughs> you know, and it just switches. So um, growing up, I, I, like I said, I always played sports and I kind of contributed a lot of like me having mental health issues to possibly having concussions, like the severe concussions that I had. Um, but the traits really started happening from job to job to job um, and switching my mindset from, OK, yeah, I'm going to be here to no, I'm going to go on to the next one. Um, the most recent, like biggest trait that happened is. I was chose to self medicate and um I, I used marijuana as something to kinda help me like be like, Okay, well let me just calm myself down and let me do this and you know, um I ran with that and it became addictive and I had an episode where I had real bad um mania and it just I was like, This isn't for me but it's almost like you hear that that God calling you telling you, hey, now it's time for you to be still and really listen. And so I went to the Vallejo, and when I went to the Vallejo, they pulled up my whole history, my past, after talking to a therapist and saying, like, this is what I've done, this is what I haven't done, this is what's been going on. And he was like, sounds like you have characteristics of bipolar too. And they tried me on medicine, and the medicine really helped. Um, and then I realized that this is this is my life, you know, like I've never really knew that this were the characteristics of it. But once actually being diagnosed and prescribed a certain medicine and actually helping, I realized that, yeah, this is this is me. When you say they pulled up your history, had mm -hmm. you tried getting help before? Were they just looking at the medical history where there were some other things that were diagnosed or had you sought help before? Yeah, so I had sought help before. I had kidney failure in 2017. Oh, goodness. And yeah, so um, I had a hematoma that overtook my left kidney. Um, but before that, I was like, why am I depressed? Like, I'm not a depressive guy, you know, like, why am I like feeling like I'm having heart attacks? Why am I having anxiety? And I didn't know what it was. So back then, before they found out I was having kidney failure, um, they diagnosed me with clinically severe depression and anxiety. And going back and then looking at that, when I talked to my therapist, he was like, okay, you've been diagnosed with clinically severe depression, clinically severe anxiety. You have high highs where you're, you know, you start a job or, you know, you, you go all in on a project and you spend all your money on a project doing something and all of a sudden you're just done with it. So he pulled that up and realized, making the connection, like with bipolar two, you have really high highs and really low lows and they can switch in the matter of days or in the matter of months and you could be stuck in one of those phases for a long time. Um, so yeah, them just pulling up my history, talking to the therapist of, you know, what I was living and uh, made that connection. Let's go to the back to the medical problem. Did you mm -hmm. think that some of it was just related to the medical problem? And was that like a sports related injury that, yeah, that so caused it? I, th I think it was um, a medical related, um, like a sports related injury, actually. Uh, I played football, mm -hmm. um, I was all state line or all state free safety, all state um, return, man. So it was just one of those like, okay, yeah, I took hits. Um, and also, when I got done playing football, I ended up um, going into Muay Thai, so fighting, doing MMA training. Mm -hmm. um, so I took some hits from some pretty significant people, like pro professional fighters. And so they said it either could have been hit when I was playing football or when I was fighting. And it was just a cyst that was on my kidney that was drained in 2015. And then it came back two years later in 2017 and just kind of overtook my whole kidney and had my kidney functioning at 14%. They said anything 15% or lower is failure. So they're like, either we could take it or we could try to drain it again. But I mean, your kidney's still not functioning. So I was like, you might as well just go ahead and take it <laughs> because there's no point of going through this whole process again if it could come back. Um, and honestly, I thought like with me having depression, me having anxiety, I thought that's what was making me have those symptoms uh, was just like, oh, I'm just, my body's not regulated, right? And it's a severe medical Condition. So, For I mean, sure. certainly that's legitimate. When you face a medical For challenge, sure. I imagine that does impact your attitude. You can't do what you normally like to do. You, sure. You're facing a potentially life altering situation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. Like, I just thought it was like, okay, like maybe that's it. But after going through, you know, 2017 and then living all the way up until 2020, 
22, 23 is when I was diagnosed is uh, it realized that no, it wasn't just my kidney that was doing it because I only have one kidney now. And so my right kidney's functioning 100 percent. But um, yeah, making that connection like, no, it just wasn't that. Hmm. How old were you when you were diagnosed with the bipolar two? I was 29. That's a long time yeah. to be struggling um, and going back and forth and mm -hmm. not knowing exactly what was happening with you. Yeah. When they gave you a diagnosis, and I appreciate you explaining a little bit more about what bipolar 2 is, because I, sure. I guess we used to call it, what, manic depression? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. bipolar 2 is what, is what it is. Uh, when you got that diagnosis, was it like a light bulb moment? Was it struggling to understand what that meant? What, what was the reaction? I think mainly it was struggling to, to know what it meant. I remember sitting in the car because my dad took me to uh, Vallejo and then after I came out with the paper saying like I was diagnosed with bipolar 2, I was looking in the car, I was like, I know I'm not crazy. You know, like, and a lot of people put that stigma on mental health, like, oh, you have this diagnosis, you're crazy. Um, and I caught myself doing it, I was like, but I'm not, I know I'm not. But it was just an understanding of like, probably three months in me realizing like okay like you could still live a normal life you just have to understand where you're at and when you're going through those phases of depression and mania um so honestly it was a little bit of both to where it was like at first i was kind of like lost and then once i finally accepted it is when i had that light bulb moment of like i could still live a life like i'm it's my life's not over you know it's actually just now beginning because now with me understanding where i'm at I can kind of change my course of where I really want to go. When I catch myself on, you know, days where I don't want to get out of bed, I'm like, why do I feel like this? Oh, yeah, I do have bipolar, too, so I'm in a depressive state right now. So that means I got to get up and move my body. I have to intentionally do that compared to just rolling out of bed and just being like, all right, well, I'm just going to go with the flow. Why did your dad take you to Vallejo? What happened? Uh, so I had, I, I was self-diagnosed with, um, you know, marijuana at the time, and I had a real bad mania episode. And I... Um, I was freaking out, like honestly, like I was freaking out. I was walking around my house, like lost, lost my mind. Um, and I called him because I felt like I was having a heart attack and my anxiety was just through the roof. I was going through a phase where I was running my own gyms and um, I had a lot of clients and then I needed to close down for my mental health because working from 4 a.m. till 11 p.m. Monday through Friday, then going on Saturday, six days a week, it was just taking a toll on me. So I decided to shut down for a month at the time and thought I could just self-diagnose or self-medicate and uh, figure out, like, I just need some calm in my life. And I had a really bad uh, manic episode. And so I called him and he sat there with me until two, three in the morning, you know, and just talking, like opening up, like, this is what I'm doing. This is what's going on. Um, and then I went to... Um, I, I called Vallejo the next day and they got me into an appointment because I told them what happened uh, and just kind of went from there. Did your family and friends realize what was going on with you or did they, for, to, from the outside looking in with them, was it kind of like, okay, well, you're just having a bad day, we'll leave them alone today and then you would come back around when you were back on a high? I think so. Like my wife, uh, my wife and my, my son, I have a four-year-old son and uh, my wife, uh, they just kind of, you know, it was like, oh, dad's just not having a good day today, you know, so, um, but honestly, I was self-medicating so much that I was masking everything, so, like, if I knew I was going through something, I would go out and self-medicate, you know, and I'd be like, okay, I'm fine, you know, like, let me just catch this, and then I'll be, I'll be back onto my normal level, but it came to a point where I was just constantly every, every hour, every two hours, you know, I had to go out there and self-medicate, and so, it became an issue, um, but I think a lot of people just kind of overlooked it, you know, and a lot of, like, a lot of our friends nowadays, um, we just kind of be like, oh, they're having a bad day, not really getting to what the root of the problem is. You know, yeah, you can have a bad day, but what's causing that bad day? You know, have you really looked at and broke down, like, everything that's going on in your life and understanding why that bad day is happening? Before you knew that it was bipolar 2 that was going on and you started to get some education on mm -hmm. how to deal with those highs and lows, how were the highs and lows kind of feeding into each other and becoming kind of this self-perpetuating cycle? And I guess by that I mean you're on, a, you're on a manic phase, you're feeling great, you're successful, you've got all these clients, I'm really killing it out here, I'm getting everything done, and then all of a sudden something goes wrong, mm -hmm. and then you get in this depressive state, feeling like a failure or not knowing why you were feeling that way. I mean, how much did it start to, to feed the cycle? 
It was it was pretty consistent, honestly. Like I would, it's called um, having a God complex, you know. So when I would sign up new clients, like I would walk around and be like, I'm the man, you know. Like I, yeah, of course everybody wants to do this training. Of course everybody wants to do that. And um, then all of a sudden, like one client would be like, hey, you know, I'm going on vacation this week, and you know, I'm just gonna, or I'm this month, and I'm gonna stop my training. And then all of a sudden, that one client, even though I might have signed up 20, you know, that one client kind of just would like send me through a phase of like. All right, now what's going on? Like, why is this happening? I need to do this. I need to do this. Maybe I need to offer more classes. So it puts you in a in a super high guy complex, and it puts you down into a very low depressive state. And if you don't know how to deal with it, like I said, I was self medicated. I didn't know how to deal with it. So understanding that, man, I need to I need to do more. It kind of drives back you into a mania state. Mm-hmm. And so it's just a constant rapid rapid cycle and that's what bipolar 2 is it's it's rapid cycling so you go high to low high to low high to low you kind of very rarely find that in between um i found the in between a lot more now because i've accepted who i am and understanding like what i need to do to get to that state but it was very consistent back then so tevin 2.0 yes or 3.0 whatever phase you want to call this you get the diagnosis you Mm -hmm. know what's going on um once you got past the shock of gosh does this mean i can't have a successful life Mm -hmm. what was the education process like in learning that you can have a successful life and here's how to do it learning those steps i imagine with some help yeah yeah um i really was i just kind of you know, just did my own research. You know, the Vallejo is a very great resource here. So they gave me a lot of um, pamphlets of understanding like who I am and like what bipolar two is like and what that looks like with the characteristic traits. Um, but a lot of it was me doing my own research on saying like, okay, hypomania is this, you know, where you're going from, you know, very low to going to very high and you're not necessarily delusional to where you're hallucinating seeing different things, but you're like, I'm going to go all in on, you know, I, there's a, a video on TikTok where I say I have bipolar two. Of course, um, I just spent all my money in my savings account on my Amazon cart, you know, where you go through phases like that, where you might, okay, I got this money. I got my paycheck. Now I'm going to go spend everything in my Amazon cart and I want to buy that. Um, so it was one of those things where me understanding, like, I need to do my own research to, you know, what this is like. And that's really what kicked off, like, after doing that, kicked off a lot of my social media following is I started explaining that more in like a humanistic way compared to being like, this is the doctor term of like what it looks like, me putting a face behind of, I live with this, this is what I go through, um, kind of helped a lot. What message, and I, I guess first of all, what, is, what has the reaction been like when you share those things? Um, what, what are people sharing with you? A lot, a lot. So I've had, I've had a lot of people um, uh, reach out to me on my TikTok, reach out to me on my Facebook, Instagram. Um, there's people um, in Brazil that actually like they're like messaging me on my Instagram, they're like you're viral over here for your bipolar two stuff because people don't talk about it. Um, and me opening up and humanizing my life with it humanizes myself to where other people can reach out to me and ask for advice. Um, so it's honestly been it's been pretty wild to see like how a lot of people kind of shade, you know, put it in the shadows of like, oh, this is, I have mental health issues. But when I actually bring the light to it, there's a lot of people that are like, I finally see that and they come into it. So it's been quite the journey. Um, a lot of people have opened up and like I said, it, that just comes with being authentic, you know, sharing who I am and I have, I have nothing to be ashamed of. You know, I think if we all live like that, then life will be a lot better for us. What can people learn from looking at you and from seeing the videos and not just about bipolar two, but about, you know, I think sometimes people um, hear a diagnosis no matter what it is and they think, well, gosh, what does that mean for me going forward? Um, Much like you reacted when you first got the news, you Mm -hmm. know, what does this mean for me going forward? And I feel like in this conversation and and learning about you and seeing you, what you've learned in the reality is it doesn't necessarily have to mean anything, no, right? Yeah. I mean, you can still make the choices that you make and do what you do. You just now know how to cope with things better. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you're 100% right. Um, it's one of those, like, it, it's not going to stop you, you know, or well, it, it shouldn't stop you. So it can stop you, but I, I truly believe that, and I tell people all the time, is mindset is everything. So if you go into something thinking that's going to be bad, or if you go into something thinking that's going to be positive, it is what you make it. Um, so... I don't, I don't think it should stop anybody. I think it should really, oh, I, if anything, use it as a superpower um, and, you know, and, and really run with it because that's what's going to help you 
be you in the world to where we get on Facebook, we get on TikTok, we get on Instagram, Twitter, and people are trying to only show the best part of their lives. But when you open up and show like, this is who I am and I'm a human just like you, it really opens up the door for people to realize being like, oh, like you're really, you're really like me, you know? And it kind of, kind of helps spread things and make things even for everybody. And that's really the, the power of social media because that's kind of what I was asking earlier. When, mm -hmm. when you post on social media and we only see positive Tevin yeah. without looking for those other things, I think everybody gets in that trap. You know, the, sure. the, the, I can't remember the phrase that some people have, have coined about it, but you know, you're looking at this, you know, whether it's fear of missing out mm -hmm. or you, know, you, you start comparing yourself to everybody else. Because yeah. like you said, people post only the good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but when people start posting both things, I, that helps everybody. It does, it does. And honestly, it, if, if I stepped into being a full-time content creator um, in April of this year, uh, so I literally only do content creation, collaborations, things like that, but it's really helped me understand like, you're not gonna post only the best things, you know what I mean? Like if you really wanna grow, if you really wanna show who you are, I don't have to worry about like, oh, if I post this, I'm gonna lose this followers because I'm being 100% me. So I don't ever have to like try to go on camera and just be like a, a fake smile or anything like that. Everything's real genuine. Everything is real genuine with everything that I do. And um, when you open up and you show that side of you, it really makes you you, you know, it really wants people to, makes people want to connect with you. How lows would the lows get before? Pretty low. Like there's times where I thought like, I, I don't need to be here no more. You know, there's times where I've literally contemplated not being here anymore. And those, those times were very hard. Um, but once I realized that I'm just in a low phase or, you know, once my wife came in and was like, Hey, like what's going on? Like, are you okay? Um, it kind of helped me snap out of it, but there was definitely really, really low times for sure. How lows do the lows get now? Are they still that low or are you able to recognize immediately what's happening and take the steps that you need to take? I think they don't, they definitely don't get as low. Um, I recognize where I'm at now. Um, I stick to a routine. One thing with bipolar two or bipolar is we have to stick to a routine. Um, a lot of people ask me that question like, well, what do you do when you're at this phase? Like me sticking to my routine keeps me even. You know, if I wake up, read my devotional, drink my coffee, have my breakfast, you know, spend time a little bit of the time with my son, you know, give my wife a kiss, um, do my workout, get my workout in. To, these days it's a lot crazier because I'm from Topeka stuff is kicking off a lot more <laughs> than what we expected it. But um but sticking to a routine, making sure I move my body, making sure I read, making sure I give a little bit of time to myself is very huge on me keeping my balance. Now, I can get out of routine sometimes and it's not gonna automatically send me down to a low, but it will throw me off. And my wife will tell you, she'll be like, yeah, like you need to go do your routine because like you're, you're kind of getting out of whack. I'll get irritable real quick. Um, so I could go from smiling, happy, ha ha, to really upset like I don't want to talk to nobody and that's part of bipolar too you know it's like when I can go to a point where I'm like okay I want to be around everybody then it goes to a point where it's like I could go weeks without talking to anybody and it's not because I'm upset at anybody it's just disassociation like it's just a character trait to where I don't want to be around nobody and it's not because like I said I'm mad but it's just I just don't want to talk you know, right. so sticking to that routine definitely helps. Well, I think the advice you offer is good for anybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether it's bipolar two, everybody has high, highs and lows. For sure. And so the things that you mentioned are, are good advice for everyone. How grateful are you to, first of all, your dad? Yes. For saying, dude, this isn't right. Yeah, yeah. And you got to go somewhere yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, very, very grateful. Very grateful. I mean, I wouldn't be the man I am today without him. Like, he's taught me everything in life. Um, you know, when I when I looked up to be, uh, you know, law enforcement, I used to work in law enforcement. I used to be a Shawnee County Sheriff's officer. Um, just one of those many jobs that I've had by thinking like this is what I want to do. But um, him being a role model, you know, being a leader in the community, too, it's just been a great, great example for me to understand, like, you know, this is this is who I need to, you know, look look towards to in my life. Like when I was self medicate, my dad's always like medically or not, my dad was always like, you shouldn't be doing it, you know? And I was always like, oh, but it's good. You know, everything's legalizing and all this stuff is going on. He was like, 
I just don't just don't agree with it. Um, and really seeing that now, like being 100 percent sober is like my dad's lived his life like that his whole life. And so it's like, oh, you can live a good life and happy life and successful life being 100 percent sober. Um, so, yeah, very grateful for him. How grateful are you to your wife? Because I think when we talk about mental illness, a lot of times we forget that it's not just the person yeah. who's living with it. It impacts everybody around you. For and sure. from what you describe, it got rough for a while yeah. with you personally and yeah. would have been enough for anyone to say, you know what, we've tried. We've hung in there, but you're not doing anything. You're not making any changes. We're out of here. Yeah. So how grateful are you to that family and yeah. friends who stuck with you and said, we know you got what it takes to know what's going on and take those steps? Uh, very grateful. You know, I, would, I, I told my wife um, from the very beginning, we got... We started dating in 2016, and she's been by my side literally the whole step. When I had kidney failure, she stayed in the hospital with me. Um, we moved in an apartment. We've been through, we've been through a lot together. Uh, moving states, moving back. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for her. I always tell her she's my rib, you know, because without her, I, I truly wouldn't be here. Um, because there's times where I was very, very low and just sitting there talking to her and, you know, being able to, you know, as a man, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, men shouldn't cry. You know, you shouldn't show weakness in front of your wife or anything like that. There's been times where I've literally shown the the weakest of points in my life in front of my wife. And she just sat there and held me while I cried, you know, and like just let it all out. So uh, very grateful for her <laughs> and very grateful for my son. My son's four years old, but he he knows like when I get to a point he's like all right dad you know it's okay like you know it's gonna be all right um so very grateful for them for sure and it is men's health awareness month and you brought that yes. up you know men sometimes are resistant to seeking help uh there also are stigmas extra stigmas within communities of color yeah so you're speaking out what do you want people who are men mm -hmm. uh, and people who are in those communities where there's always been this resistance to getting help you know suck it up buttercup and yeah. do what you need to do yeah. what kind of message do you have for them I think uh, you should just go go seek go go seek therapy you know talk to a therapist because you don't realize a lot of the things that you're doing in life you know um, addiction you know um, your disassociation from people it, it it's something it's childhood trauma it's PTSD from something that you grew up with and growing up and you know my dad being black and me being black it's one of those things like we didn't really talk about growing up you know it was like oh you bumped your head or you know you had a bad day like suck it up life is going to continue to grow but the more that we step back and we really really look at why is this happening why am i acting this way it's because there's some inner trauma so i definitely think that men um men of color you know men in general should go out there and, and seek help, you know, just talk to a therapist because even if you spend that one therapy session, talk to a therapist, you're going to be like, wow, that's getting that off my chest, you know, really kind of help. And then it'll, it could lead into other things to where you open up and really find out who you truly are instead of putting a mask on and walking around in, in the world. What's the main lesson you've learned about yourself? Just keep going. I mean, just keep going. No matter what, uh, Adversity, I've been through a lot, um, but the more I just show up, be present in life, and continue to put one foot in front of the other and keeping my faith with me, um, you, you can go a lot further. And final words, what do you want everybody to know? Spread love and spread peace. That's my, that's my main message. Uh, the world that we live in, you can turn on the TV and you can see negativity everywhere, but go out and be that light. Go out and spread love and spread peace um, because the more that you do that, the more that you'll realize that life will be a lot more beautiful for you. Well, life is beautiful because you are here. And Thank so we you. appreciate that. Thank we appreciate you. you opening up and sharing your story. You know, if anything resonates with Tevin, just look him up on social media. He's <laughs> sure. everywhere. He'd be happy to hear from you. But if you yes. need resources, you can go to wibw.com slash hear me, see me. The contact information for Vallejo is there. But if you are in crisis right now or you or someone you love is in crisis right now, remember that 988 hotline is there 24-7 to help you or maybe get some help for a loved one as well. We are so glad that you are here. We hear you. We see you. Have a good day.